Kokonos! Happy... I, my, already, my camera's already frozen. We started streaming with my camera frozen. Your camera's frozen. God, my camera's frozen. I'm, I'm glad it's nobody frozen heard like the Kokonos. <laughs> You stop I... eating well, can you guys stop eating Wawa Hoogies over the bus? Yeah, stop eating Wawa oh. Hoogies over the This is unhinged, oh. truly. How did <laughs> I yeah, fix this last time? Everybody stop. I, uh, <laughs> I restart everything. I, think oh. I appreciate Oz's uh, face at the moment. Yeah. High, oh, fantasy where, uh, yeah. high fantasy where nothing is different except el high elves have Philly accents. <laughs> oh my god, please no. Welcome, we're back. <laughs> After some immediate technical difficulties, we, <laughs> we, uh, we joined for tonight's episode of Del Requisite. Here on proficiency bonus. Like it's sponsored by Hoagie Fest. Sponsored right? by Hoagie Fest. Uh, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> sweet tie dye shirts. Oh, shut up. Uh, there's so fun fun fact of the day. Uh, I live in a place where Wawas are not as common, and there's more Royal Farms now. Uh, oh, uh, and they sucks. have they have their own thing <laughs> that they do. <laughs> Uh, when Wawa does Hoagie Fest, they're like, I, and I cannot, it's like, it's like chicken palooza or something. <laughs> I really figured it would be crabs, but chicken, go off. Nope, it's chicken fine. palooza. Okay. okay. All right, and, go uh, off, Marilyn. I did almost. It's old I, chicken. I, I did very much almost buy a chicken palooza, like, soccer jersey uh, style see? shirt. And I you should have supported, the other day. you should have supported your community, Matthew. My, yeah, the, the, the massive the chicken chain palooza. convenience store, Royal Farms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. I don't like Wait, why can't it, even, can't it be even on brand or something? Why isn't it on, like, the chicken royal wedding or something? I don't know. Yeah, like, okay. Chicken Jubilee! Let's, let's move know. it on. Anyway. anyway, moving this along to the actual sponsors of this episode, not Hoagies, not the Poconos. Uh, no, our real life, our real life right to can right tell, guys. Can you tell that we were talking about Always Sunny in Philadelphia before we went on, uh, we went on air? Uh, they don't need uh, no, the that. actual sponsors, uh, Little Dragon Corp and Cardboard Castle. Uh, exclamation point Little Dragon, exclamation point CGC during uh, stream. At any point tonight, you get a link to uh, those fine sponsors' <laughs> websites. And, Wonderful uh, sponsors. If yous, uh, if yous all want to want to get some dice, uh, yous can enter the code uh, bonus for uh, fifteen percent off your order. <laughs> and so much. <laughs> uh, if any of our viewers are from Philadelphia, uh, we're sorry that you're you know what you did. You know what you did. <laughs> yeah, you know listen, what? I'm not we, we don't need to tell you. You know what you're Enjoy like. Enjoy a nice cold glass of water. You water. <laughs> actually, actually, you know what? If there's somebody from Philadelphia right now listening, go Eagles. <laughs> go Birds. <laughs> go Birds. Uh, go Birds. Christ. Worst fans in the country of any sport. Anyway. Uh, nice balls. Go Birds. Okay, let's go. This is this is off deeply off the rails. Um let's uh let's let's focus up, gang. Uh okay. recap time. Let's go. Uh, you guys have just uh, arrived back in Ladrius Keep in the uh, the Ordinum Libri's city state of Terra Libra. Uh, you used your teleportation scroll to return uh, all of your yourselves along with your your new tag along cloud um, from the Igni Empire uh, to return after having secured the uh, the chronomancy device that you went to. Uh, Shivas and Varya to retrieve, uh, along with a, a whole slew of other uh, magical goodies that you guys thiefed out of their uh, their secure vaults in the High Octuratos. Oh, oh yeah. Um, we saw Alar the backstory. Um, we uh, we were introduced to uh, Arnold Zalzavuth, or as uh, he has has recently uh, just been revealed to y'all, the Silver Dragon Zalzavuth. Um. Okay, so Zanzibar. Nice Zanzibar, thing. yeah, Zanzibar, the uh, Zoltar, <laughs> Zoltar, the uh, <laughs> Zoltar, the silver, <laughs> the silver dragon. Uh, he uh, he basically covered your guys' exit, uh, preparing to like wreak havoc, making his own escape from uh, from the High Octuratos. Um, Wonderful man, Wonderful can, dude. Uh, confirming that he would he would come and regroup with you later. Uh, so we'll pick up basically right where you guys uh, finished last session. You <laughs> appear in the center of Ladrius Keep. Um, it is probably like mid-afternoon, tor tending towards late afternoon at this point. Um, 
uh, this is where we discover that time zones probably are a thing in this world, right? You you essentially, uh, you were getting towards the end, the latter part of the day in Shavas and Varya, and you have now gone west to the other side of the continent, essentially. Uh, okay, so yeah. it's, uh, it's late afternoon when you arrive. Um, as you guys, like, shake off the momentary disorientation of having your, uh, your physical selves translocated halfway across a continent, um, you see that, uh, there's, there's actually quite a few people in the, uh, in Ladrius Keep, in this main hall of Ladrius Keep. Um, the bookkeepers seem to be, like, in a flurry of activity, um, as you guys make your appearance. Um, one individual uh, spotting your arrival uh, peels off from uh, the path that they were uh, they were walking on, and uh, Mishkalantia Kalruk, uh, who you have met several times, uh, comes like jogging up to you. Um, she kind of like looks all over uh, the group of you, um, and she says, "You have returned. You were the successful then." We were, and we've got a hell of a story, but what the hell is going on? Uh, she says, shortly after you left on your mission, we received word that the Ignean army had begun a further westward push. Their army has been moving at uh, all speed uh, in a direction that indicates that only their final destination can be here. We believe they intend to siege Terra Libra. They... Well, I'm glad we released that dragon then. I'm sorry, what? There's uh, the dragons could now. We could, yeah, could we convene a meeting of the High Council and the Council of Eight? We Which, really... Uh, she says, we can. Um, unfortunately, um, it will take some time to gather them all. Um, several of them are not in the city at present. Um, of course not. All, all members of the Ordinum uh, have been uh, recalled to return to the city as we make preparations for uh, the coming siege and to raise the city's arcane barrier. Um, several of them are uh, away from the city. I can uh, send a message to uh, recall them from their business, but uh, it will likely be uh, not until the morning that we may be able to put a, uh, a full debriefing together with the council and yourselves. Um, uh, do you want the brief version then? Uh, I would appreciate the brief version, yes. Alright, uh... Managed to make it into Shivas and Varia. Fortunately got spotted. Got into the uh, Hayek Tortas. At, uh, on a very, very hidden sub-level of it, somebody that I knew ten years ago was being held. A halfling by the name of Arnold Zalzabeth. Who apparently isn't a halfling. He's a silver dragon. I didn't know. We got him out. We retrieved the device. Uh... Alar holds up the staff. A few other goodies from their uh, secret uh, stash. Uh, proceeded to destroy said secret stash. Um, got to the main level. Uh, High Council Le at Layroth was there. Um, and about a hundred Ignean soldiers. This is where we learned Arnold was a silver dragon. Transformed into it. Uh, proceeded to burn pretty much all of them to death. We teleported out. He said he would meet us here. Uh, that is quite the tale. Um, this silver dragon, uh, you are certain that he is an ally to you? Dragons are... Uh, uh, metallic yeah, dragons mentioned... are thought to be uh, mythological. Ten years, yeah, ten years ago, I met him uh, in... Why am I blanking on the name? The oh, you met you met the him name. outside of uh, Talmark and Vale. Yeah, I met him in Talmark. He was traveling as a, a peddler, a fixer of things, a mender, a scrivener, a whole bunch of other one of those traveling uh, salesman types. He was going into the Empire during an Amaranth fever outbreak to try and cure the sickness. Which he did, over the course of several months. He also taught me a great deal. I don't, I can't say that 
you know, he, you know, this, well, I know him exceptionally well, obviously. I didn't know it was a dragon. She sort of, but... like, rubs her forehead a little bit, and she says, Until uh, several weeks ago, uh, it had been thought that dragons had been extinct for several hundred years, and until your story today, it had been thought that uh, the metallic dragons were mythological. Uh, I think it is safe to say that we are all on, uh, in uncharted territory. I shall settle myself for hoping that this dragon is uh, an ally to you, as you say, and in lieu of that, hoping that uh, it is far enough on the far side of the continent that it is a bigger problem for the Empire than it will be for us in the elites, uh, the immediate. He mentioned he knew Torian, or he and Torian had kind of had run-ins because he made allusions to Torian's meddling. Um, if Torian didn't take him off the map before, I would assume maybe then we can trust him as well. Uh, she's like, dash me, friend. Torian, yeah. Torian. Okay. Um, the device, you have retrieved it. This a chronomancer. I have it. I hold it up, but then I hold it to my chest. Like, clearly, like, no one is taking this thing from me. She says, um, she says, uh, prior to the council meeting, uh, tomorrow, um, might I recommend that you pay, uh, Master Volodov a visit. Uh, he is the, uh, she, like, speaking to you, because I don't, I don't know if she, yeah, she knows you know who he is. Um, she says, uh, pay, pay Master Volodov a, a visit in the workshop and, uh, have him take a look at it. Um, I don't know that we know how this device works yet, and uh, it would be a good idea to have him give it a once over. We've got a few of those actually, so uh, we'll we'll definitely be paying a visit. Um, she now she says, "I will make arrangements and send necessary uh, messages to uh, have the uh, the council recalled with all haste uh, to inform uh, them of your." Uh, your news, and uh, I will try to set something up for the AM. Um, until then, uh, do as you will. Uh, obviously, you have uh, some matters of your own to attend to. If you uh, should desire to uh, join in the preparations, making the city ready for siege, um, I am sure your hands uh, would be most welcome. She, like, gives uh, you guys a, a kind of a curt nod, and unless anybody, like, stops her with anything else, she, like, spins on her heel and takes off at a light jog uh, back whence she came to go presumably begin sending some messages. Okay, uh... Ooh, I should boundary first, back. and then... whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's go deal with these items that we found. Star wipe. Changing our background back to the Terra Libra map. Bang. Okay. Terra Libra's behind me. I don't even. I, I forget. I did forget to point this out. Uh, just so. Yep. What's happening over here? Why is there like a. Oh, that's why. Boop. It was offset. Uh, I did forget to mention on stream, if anybody is wondering why Curtis is a, a still frame image of a skeleton at a table in the Krusty Krab, it's because his camera uh, is currently MIA uh, after a, uh, a move. Uh, so boy. that's Curtis from tonight. I know a lot of viewers at home are like, what? I didn't I didn't notice the difference. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> right? Burn. Oh, uh, Matt, before Burn. I forget again, I yes. uh, meant to mention before. Uh, the uh, stream. Uh, at some point, there's supposed to be a letter. Yes. Okay. I will. Uh, we just got a letter. We'll handle that. We just got a okay. letter. This letter has been floating in the ether for a while as the, uh, the session that it was supposed to appear in Adam was not here for, so we're going to do it tonight. Whoopsie. Uh, as I. Okay, Ooh, Russell's camera. got bigger. little corner of Russell's camera was sticking out into the uh, into the, the Mac window. Same with it. Uh, okay, so you guys want to head to uh, the workshop first. 
Uh, All right. So you head uh, you head out of Ladry's Keep to the ancillary building that is uh, the uh, the workshop. Um, the large building as you enter is as always like significantly hotter than the outside as there are a number of like kilns and furnaces uh constantly being run um you see that there are an abnormal amount of people uh at work at like workstations in here that appear to be crafting um things that uh at first glance uh kind of hard to tell what they are they're they're doing some kind of magic shit uh that they're that they're artificing right now um as you guys come in uh you see that uh boris volodov is on like one of the catwalks uh like that goes over the workshop floor um and he is like shouting down uh to uh, a small army of uh of artificers that are like following around this directions uh he's like you dare bring the glass lenses over to the kiln to be f- uh, to be fired you prepare the etching we need to get these runes inscribed quickly hurry up now no time to waste uh and everybody's like, scrambling around uh, uh hey Lars going to use this staff and like master volodov he spots you when he comes in and he goes, ah, you're not dead! Good! And he, boom, 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 like, stomps coming coming down here. Uh, comes down the steps and uh, puts his hands on his, his hips and, like, surveys over you. Uh, and he says, I see that you have returned in one piece. This is good. And unless one of you has uh, divided asexually and become a wayfish elf man, you have a new visitor. Who is this? And he points at Cloud. Who's just cloud. kind of following you around, like, doesn't know what to do. Uh, he helped us uh, at the High Octortas at risk to himself, so uh, we brought him along. This is... Hmm. Fine for now. We will deal with you later, though. Uh, he says, what have you brought me? I assume you came here because you want me to look at something. Uh, a stick, a book, and a pearl. And they a got very a few, important box. They got a oh, yeah, things. probably probably the box. That's um, We can do the box place. last. I feel like that's going to take the longest amount of time. Uh, Alar's going to hold out the staff. Still have the note on it here. Uh, he, he like kind of looks at it and he, he reads it. And he says, This note, this was uh, put with this item by the Empire's uh, archivists who stored this item? Yes. So I would have no reason to believe that uh, it is untrue. Uh, he says, if, uh, if this is accurate, this is an incredibly powerful artifact indeed. Hmm. Uh, just had a thought, Rom. Your your friend. Might this be worth testing that? Certainly try. Is we... it he in All right, yes. the other place? He's in Zresa. We... He's uh, in Zresa. He's not we here. We can we can make a re- uh, we can contact uh, the speaker. Yeah. Have her uh, send his leave? body. Did we leave them with a bag of holding? No. No, I don't believe so. Nuts. That would have been funny. Um. Uh, who wants to go next? Well, I want to keep this, so I'm gonna show. I'm just gonna show him the. <laughs> so, I got. Uh, so t- t- for the for the sake of expediency. Um, yeah, he can he the, can basically confirm is, that all of those items yeah. are what they are, um, sure. and essentially what like what he will say to you um, is like he does not make any type of demands that you give him any of these items that you have procured. Um, he basically says to you uh, probably in in like in response to Walter being like ah oh, I kind of want to keep this one. Um, he says uh, he says the Ordinum's rules are extremely clear on these type of things if an item is not considered 
a threat to the general well-being of the public by its mere existence. Uh, we do not believe that we have any authority to uh, supersede the right of... Uh, well, there's a technical term for it, but essentially Finders Keepers is a big deal around here. <laughs> you recovered these say. relics. By rights, they belong to you. I have not the authority to demand you give them to me. Um, he, Presuming that we don't end up using this. He, uh, he, yeah, he, he does, like, specifically turn to you, though, ALR, and he goes, like, In your case, however, I would make the request that, if possible, you do not uh, burn that item out as the magics that it is supposedly capable of wielding would be world-changing if harnessed properly. Well, we'd like to... Uh, we'd like to give it a test, and if it does indeed work, then... Uh, as advertised, then I have no problems uh, turning this over to hopefully be duplicated. He nods. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll take care of the deck. Did you show him the deck? Uh, or are you keeping that one to yourself? <laughs> maybe, me actually, maybe I'll keep like that one to myself. It. That's that's yeah, yeah. yeah, that's okay. If you if you like keep that one to yourself, that's probably a good after idea. because I I'm feel not like going on that, on it. that no, one definitely no, falls I... under the category of something he would describe as a, a clear and present threat to the safety yeah. of the public. <laughs> Yeah, after hearing that phrase, I feel like my hands are behind my back, kind of just like thumbing the outside of the deck, and like and being like, "Yeah, maybe I don't say anything about this." And I, I want to say like, Osrius has like this probably weird look on his face. Other than it, most of the looks that he has is of like being stern or just like kind of like always having that resting stone face, as we'll call it. He's kind of like. Maybe like a little like, oh shit, kind of on his face because <laughs> I think Osrius. I, I think I want to say that Osrius knows of this and has heard has heard of stories as he was as like as he's been like very curious of like human nature and like magic and stuff like that. So he's just very much like, oh shit, this exists and like it is very very it's a bad very. It's a bad one. It's a big one. <laughs> yeah. This is a very important thing in this, like, culture and of, like, not only of, like, human sure. culture, but of, like, humanity. And I'm like, oh. So I kind of have, like, an oh shit face on, but I'm, sure. like, keeping everything smooth. Maybe sweating a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. Um, so as he, you know, he, he, like, looks over the items that you show him. Um, and now for the biggie. Rowan's holding it obscenely tightly like her her knuckles are white around it well, and she's, it, she's willing to show Volodov it but she's also like I'm not willing to let this thing out of my sight well, like, and Alar remembers he fishes out the crystals that came with it from the bag okay. um, so he, uh, he you show it to him but like <laughs> when he like when he goes to like like turn it to like look at it a different way and you like <laughs> Yeah. He sort of like he sort of tilts his head and, and raises an eyebrow at you, and he says, um, "I presume that you have already informed someone who is calling the council together to Cal review Rook. whatever it is that is uh, to be shown by this device." Um, yeah. I I can tell you that uh, it is going to take me some time to figure out how to use it. Um, but I see that you are reticent to let it out of your possession. If you are... I was you are almost... interested in staying here. Yes. I... She shakes her head a bit. She's like, nearly... Nearly died over this piece of tech years ago. And... Now that it's back in my hands... I trust you, but I need to see things for myself through it. I need to know what I was almost killed over. So any help I can be, I will. And I will not be leaving here, so consider yourself having a new helper for a while. I have no problem with this. I respect the desire to trust what you can see with your own eyes and touch with your own hands. 
I will not uh, object to uh, having you uh, accompany me while I examine this device and try to figure out its workings so that we may glean what information we have from it. Um, he, uh, he like stuff the crystals back in the bag and he will carefully hand them to uh, to Rowan uh, as she continues to clutch the uh, uh, the Volodov, box. Volodov like, looks past you guys and he like snaps his fingers uh, at, at one of his like passing assistants and he goes, You there! This is... Go and f- find someone to fetch the uh, the high elven guest. I am understanding that she has familiarity with the workings of this device. I may need her insight. And they like, uh, sir, and they run off. Um, he says, uh, well then, as for the rest of you, if there is nothing else you are needing from me, I must figure out this piece of equipment and oversee uh, the defensive sigils uh, crafted onto uh, a significant amount more of these arcane folk islands. Uh, Alars quickly scribbles a uh, note. Uh, when Zintris, who will be coming with uh, the High Elven guest, comes, please have her cast sending to the speaker uh, this uh, and it's basically a short request. Please send um, Sinclair's body to Terra Libra okay. uh, with all haste. Cool. Um, already. Um, is there? So I'll, I'll I'll put the question this way so that we can uh, we don't have to dilly with with stuff that you guys aren't interested in if you don't want to. Um, essentially, y'all have the time here to like do s- something. You know, if if you so choose with with the day, um, so I would say like if there's one thing you know that anybody wants to do, speak now. Uh, and if you're pretty much just content to like say my, you know my character goes and you know helps people pile up sandbags or whatever it is that they're doing to prepare the city for siege, um, that's fine and we'll like we'll advance forward. But I you know I want to give you guys the opportunity to like go somewhere in the city, do something, uh, you know, have, have a scene if you, if you so choose. I think Walter would try to, uh, attempt to help with the sigils, mostly because he's curious, but also, like, I think the various magics I have can help with that. And then, uh, if, barring that, uh, basically just helping with defense. Okay, no problem. So, uh, probably similar. Aylar, uh, offer up whatever whatever spells he knows uh, to uh, if they need to be cast into uh, rune sigils like uh, and then once he's expended his spell uh, usage uh, uh, he'd probably send Scooter with a, a little note tied around uh, his neck to uh, check on the arcane eye wizards okay. let him know hey we're back Alrighty. Uh, us, Rom. Uh, I would say that the only thing I might do would be see if I can track down anybody who wants to trade trade for this book. But you I can I certainly know. go. I don't know what probably, I would be looking. It's probably for. not a scene we necessarily need to like visualize you would know that you could go to Kestra Hall the Relic Hunters Hall and talk to either Paolo Monteblanc the head of the Relic Hunters or their quartermaster Lenare Molyneux um, and like be like hey I have this like I want to trade it for something um, and this like this thing is a like a badass enough piece of equipment that like I would say you tell me like something that you want Brom to acquire and as long as it's not like out of the realm of possibility that like they would be able to get their hands on one through the like through the, the bookkeepers like we'll say that they they okay. get one and they trade you for the book I don't know what I want but yeah I'll you have you have some time to like think of. that's why I say we don't need to play this out you can think about yeah. it and then like tell me oh this is what I want to trade that book for I, I just realized there's one thing I would like to do uh if I, I'm not helping, I want to figure out how this armor I have works. As I'm, I've been running around in this gimp suit for the last. Oh uh, like, yeah, day and the half. gimp suit armor. 
Oh, and yeah. uh, I I was like I, I don't know what it does and I don't know who can do what it does. Okay. And I feel like I don't want to ask Volodov because I feel I feel like he'd give me shit for it. <laughs> um. What do you, you do in you your bedroom? Is what that you want to go talk to? Um. I feel like I feel like the lady from Sears would give me Nuri less, Rattlesnap. Yes. Yeah, Rattlesnap would probably give me less shit for this than uh, Volodov would. Sure. I gotta find the particular book that that uh, is from. that item comes from Merchants of Magic by Evan Tier Games. A neat book I picked up. Looking at the magic items, there is the deck of many things, and under that, the deck of several things. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there's another one! <laughs> so, um, Walter, you go and you visit Nuri Rattlesnap. Um, you're like, hey, I got this armor, uh, it's got this key, I don't know what this armor does. Um, and she's like, oh, let, yeah, let me see the key, let me, let me get in. Says, hmm, yes, yes, I... I think I have some arcane tests that I can run to potentially determine the, uh, the effect of this armor. Uh, it will be very complicated and extremely, uh, extremely complex. And then she just, like, real fast, she just, like, crams the key into the lock in the armor and turns it to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Exterior of Sears. Um, so... What you learn from uh, her basically surprise keying you is that uh, this this uh, item is called Heartlock Armor. Uh, it is uh, it is a set of uh, magic uh, studded leather armor. Um, it comes with a golden key. While wearing it, you automatically succeed your saving throw against any spell or effect that would alter your form. Uh, so, like, you can't be polymorphed while you wear this this armor, for example. Um, it has the feature, the heart lock, so that, like, lock in the, in the chest that she turned the key. Um, the armor has three charges, regains all expended charges daily at dawn. Um, as a bonus action, you can expend a charge to turn the key to a specific position in the lock in the armor centerpiece. You gain one of the following three effects from the three positions that you can turn the key to. You gain the enlarge effect. Um, so what when she when she like sticks the key in and turns it, you like double in size. <laughs> like, oh shit! <laughs> uh, you gain the reduce effect. Uh, so she turns the key and you get reduced. Uh, and then the third effect is that you cast the spell Knock. Nice. It's very useful. That is the Heartlock armor. Um, heart I lock can... Armor. Here, I'll take a picture of the... Uh... Yeah, I'll, I'll make a homebrew item. Yeah, I'll take a picture of the text so that you can copy it into a homebrew item. Sounds great. And I'll send it to you. Uh, so that is your armor. Our very scientific testing of <laughs> put the key in and see what happens. <laughs> turn, turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> uh, I feel uh, like I, I is there a, is there a does that ability slash spell like is that a until I turn it back or is it an, is it like the normal amount of spell duration? Because I want little Walter to be running around <laughs> and like coming back to the group and just not not one minute. It. One minute. Okay. One minute. No concentration required. Alrighty. I got the Ant Man. I got the, I got the Ant Man gimp suit. Let's go. <laughs> yep. We'll have to get you some orange slices. Mm-hmm. 
Oz, what are you doing? I ask with fear. <laughs> he's he's weird playing cards. No, no, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just I, picturing I, him playing solitaire with like that and like <coughs> bad choice. He's playing pick a card. Pick a card. Any card? No. Uh, no. What I'm gonna do is just like I'm gonna just stay kind of like close to the vest and not really be like I'm just gonna keep to myself. Uh, you know, just be who I am. Try to keep cool. And I don't need anything. I have all I need. Right the, here. The most powerful me. magic is friendship. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> Alrighty. Every time we have this discussion, I remind myself to like remember where I have the letter that Alar is supposed to receive. Uh. And then I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> we come to, to come to get it. Yeah, I'm sorry. I meant to mention it before stream, so you'd have more time to find it. Still have to. God, I, s I swear I got it somewhere. Dearest Alar. <laughs> Dear Mr. Trolleyweather is your new stepfather. <laughs> Please do not uh, ask further think... questions. At this point, Alar will be like, okay, she's alive. <laughs> There's been a murder. The, 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 what, the other details? Unimportant. <laughs> you need not inquire further. I am in capable hands. It was just capitalized and underlined a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he'd be like, okay, she's alive. And I, 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 <laughs> oh, I said to finally like, found it. Okay. Uh, I got it. It's your eyes with gin. <clears throat> yep. Gin and Pete Uh Okay. So, uh, you send Scooter off. Um, Scooter returns with a message uh, from the, uh, the Arcane Eye um, that says... Uh, what's that? Uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, thanks, old buddy. Um, the uh, the letter says, uh, uh, "Stop in to see us when you have a, a a moment." We have received a correspondence from Bolus Trolleyweather for you. Uh, he reads that over. You guys good? I'll be back. And Q Alar running through half of Terra Libra at a dead sprint. Uh. Not really. They're in. They're, they. Their quarters are in Ladder's Keep, so it's only like takes you like four minutes to get there. You like, um, you run, knock, knock, knock. Uh, the uh, the door opens. Uh, though uh, it was clearly opened by like a uh, mage hand, because uh, Namara is like sipping tea on a chair uh, as like the door opens, and she's Ah, Ela, come in, sit. I'm gonna miss no more. Uh, she I says, am. Uh, says, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I know. I know why you're here, Stanfield, darling. Uh, Ayla is here. Please fetch the letter that we received from uh, uh, Mr. Trolleyweather. And uh, a moment later, Stanfield comes into the room. He says, "Oh, it's excellent to see you, sir. Um, yes, we, we received this uh, several days ago. I, I hope you will not be offended." Um, but we did uh, take the liberty of, of uh, perusing the contents um, in the event that if there was something that required a more direct 
uh, intervention to reach you with news, we should know about it ahead of time. In, no offense taken. None at all. Uh, uh, Master Trolley Weather is friends with, with Master Copper Kettle, so natural to assume that it might be for him. He, uh, uh, he, he kind of chuckles. He says, I, I dare say that uh, Master Copper Kettle was uh, incredibly confused when he read the message, um, as he uh, did not remember you or anything that was discussed in the contents of this letter. Alar takes deep breath, unfolds the letter, and starts reading. <coughs> it reads as follows. I learned my lesson from the time I sent Jason a letter and he read it to himself <laughs> on stream. <laughs> it reads, um, uh, Mr. Cabot Jr. et al., it has been many months since our last correspondence, but rest assured I have not been negligent in the course of the investigation I have been conducting on your behalf. I have come upon some information which, while it perhaps creates more lines of inquiry than it closes, should prove of interest to you. I should, of course, mention that your mother has arrived safely on my doorstep and explained the series of events which had led her to seek refuge with me at your behest. You may perhaps very well have read her enclosed letter prior to my own, so I shan't spend words. And at that, you realize there's like a second page that's in your mother's handwriting. Um, Put that aside, but as far as he's concerned, he's he's already sagged back in the chair. Just. <sighs> <coughs> um, uh, bu -bu 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 you may have uh, may very well have read her enclosed letter prior to my own, so I shan't spend words. Uh, that will likely be redundant of her own. Uh, I will include only my assurances that any relative of yours will be an honored guest in my home for as long as they require sanctuary. You may be interested to know that despite my insistence that she avail herself of my hospitality as a guest, she has insisted on ingratiating herself with my staff to, as she puts it, make herself useful, which is in quotes. She has found her culinary ta talents well appreciated within my estate, to say the least. While she may be quite stubborn and insistent upon working to earn her keep, again in quotes, I think she will find I have a rather obstinate streak of my own. If she insists upon working, I insist upon paying her a fa fair wage. I have been setting aside a stipend of coin, along with what money you have sent her during your adventures, which she has agreed to have uh, me store in my lockbox. You may rest easy that your mother has, if nothing else, a financial safety net upon which to rely. On to matters of business. I have, I believe, confirmed what yourself and your colleagues, Monsieur Forzer, suspected. A concerted effort to obfuscate, erase, or otherwise destroy information regarding dragons and their role in history. I have found evidence dating back to the time of the Great Wars following the fall of the Invarian Empire, which suggests that a group of dedicated individuals have been seeking out and eliminating factual texts and historical records of mortal races' interaction with dragonkind to an unknown end. Within an incredibly rare tome, I found a short passage with a rather dense text on in within a rather dense text on Invarian diplomatic procedure referring to a draconic envoy named within the Cult of the Dragon. Further research hints that prior to the Invarian Empire's crusade to wipe out dragonkind, which culminated in the fabled death of Silarax the Black, dragons may have operated almost as independent nations of one uh, occasionally being dealt with in much the way a government might treat a hostile foreign power. This Cult of the Dragon seems to be a name for individuals who would pledge themselves in service to the creatures and act as their agents among mortal races. I believe there is evidence to suggest, reinforced by your encounter in the Mithlandian Royal Library, that this Cult of the Dragon did not die out with the dragons, and I have continued to operate, attempting and have continued to operate, attempting to erase records of dragons from history books. With the appearance of a red dragon, apparently aligned with the Ignean Empire, if the reports are to be believed, it is my speculation that the intention of these cultists was to safeguard the existence of still-living dragons in our hole. This is, of course, only conjecture at this point. Rest assured that I shall endeavor to learn more if I can. Best regards and sincere wishes of good fortune and health be Trolleyweather. You can see how that may have been helpful before some of the shit that went down <laughs> yeah. in Sreza. <laughs> uh, 
Oh. Uh, Baylor sets that one aside. He'll uh, uh, give that information to the Council of Bait. Uh, he quickly reached through the letter from his mother. Um, I will, uh, I'm gonna let you read that one. I'll send that to you. Okay. Um. <laughs> You may read that one. Where did that go? Oh, there it is. Alar, the road was long and the journey tense. I left the very night I received your missive, not knowing what was to come. It was as blind leap into dark water, but I trust you always, my son. I knew you would not steer me wrong. Mr. Thorne was a perfect gentleman as always, and arranged transportation for me out of town within an hour of my arrival on his doorstep. I've since heard that the Igni invasion uh, force marched through the town not long after my departure. I may have been first off the line, but it was not long before more refugees joined our flight south. After about a week uh, before arriving in Laguna, or else civilians fleeing the border crossed paths with the Queen Army. I did not see the Queen herself, but the line of soldiers must have stretched for, uh, on for a mile. Mr. Trolleyweather took me in on the spot when I arrived at his doorstep and has been a gracious host and good friend to me in my time here. He puts up with the mother's fretting over a son who forever insists on putting himself directly between others in danger. I cannot begin to understand what you all have become entangled in, but it seems important and Mr. Trolleyweather tells me that you and these friends of yours are more than capable of handling yourself. Though he fusses and I am a guest, I have busied myself joining staff. They are a friendly enough lot, and I'll not be a freeloader in his home. Or it keeps me from pacing ruts into his lovely hardwood floors in any event. He thinks I don't know and that he's been slipping coin into my coffer as compensation for the work. It seems to satisfy the fellow, so I've kept quiet. If your adventure brings you to these parts, do stop in and visit your poor mother. If your adventure keeps you elsewhere on this world, keep yourself safe. Now that I ask the goddess of fortune to give you all my good luck to you every night. Love, mother. P.S. Make sure you're eating enough. Those are your letters. Um, he... Pretty sure uh, he is uh, openly weeping. Uh, and uh, takes a moment, composes himself. Thank you. That is a very large load off my mind. Thank you for, for keeping this letter for me. Uh, Namara says, We have done nothing but hold a bit of mail. You are the one who is leaving behind you a trail of allies and companions in your wake. All of this good fortune comes from you and your own doing. Never would have met Master Trolleyweather without you all. Ah, perhaps that is true. I will take some credit. Thank you. Well. There's still work to be done. Uh, defenses have to be improved. Uh, thank you. I, I better, better get going. Uh, yeah. Like Church of Sandfield, thank you, thank you. Uh, give my best to to, uh, to Colin and uh, it, oh God, wow, I'm losing names. Left I, and right. I, Dimios, thank you, uh, and Master Dimios, uh, and he kind of backs out and closes All the door. Right. Cool. And, yeah. <coughs> um, what can I say? He doesn't do emotion well. Sure. Uh, so, uh, basically, um, unless I've forgotten something, I don't think anybody else was doing anything specific necessarily. Um, just helping with like, preparations. Hovering. You're hovering. You're helping with preparations. Uh, Osiris is sort of like laying low, kind of like <laughs> he's got. Like, he's just, like sitting in a dark room, like looking at the deck of many things. Like, oh god, oh boy, oh man, <laughs> oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh god. Um. Uh. So, but basically the. Uh, the remainder of the day uh, proceeds as follows. 
um, what, what you guys learn, um, you'll remember from your, your previous visits here, and, and you can see from the map behind me if you have stream open. Um, Terra Libra doesn't have, uh, like, walls and fortifications. Um, it is, uh, it's just like an open city to the, you know, to the surrounding terrain. What it does have, you learn, are these pylons which uh, appear to utilize dwarven engineering in the way that they, like, they essentially, like, rise up, like, rotating up out of the ground. Uh, if you sort of think of those, like, uh, what are those, like, traffic pylon things that go up and down? They're like that, but, like, 15 feet tall. Um, surrounding, like, the perimeter of the city. Um, there are even a number of them, like, that uh, come up out of the waters of the lake. Um, the foci that uh, the workshop is like frantically uh, etching more of, um, these things are being charged with arcane energy and they are um, inscribed with defensive sigils uh, that are then like set inside these pylons. Um, and you are, are made to understand that, like, when they get the fortifications, like, ready and put in place, um, they can essentially turn this thing on and create an arcane dome uh, over the entire, like, the entire city. Um, you, you pretty quickly learn from, like, talking to some folks that um, while the dome... Uh, pretty much they have no concerns about it being able to withstand a conventional siege like indefinitely essentially um the fact that that dragon is like potentially involved has got people a little worried um so they are like taking other precautions to like fortify the city they are like people are being you know asked to like leave their homes and congregate in like sturdier structures uh so like shelters are being set up um food and material is being like stock stockpiled and uh, and prepared to like withstand a potential hostile siege um so there is like plenty for you for y'all to do if you just like out on the street like jump in to help somebody or back at the workshop like start helping like etch glass like plenty to do rowan for your part um Volodov, uh, like, messes with this thing for several hours, um, before he eventually comes to the realization, um, with, uh, with some help from, uh, uh, Ukraine, um, that it, this, this device is, uh, capable, essentially, of, like, these crystals, um, Ukraine explains, have, like, they're, they're, like, crystallized, pieces of time, essentially. And this device can allow, like, that moment of time to be, like, essentially, like, projected into somebody so that they can witness it. Um, but only, like, one person at a time can do it, and it's not the safest. Um, the better way to do it is to use, like, it's essentially like if you think of the the box as like your computer and you need like a monitor um and uh what she is able to describe volodov is like oh we have one of those uh and they go dig this fucking obelisk out of like storage somewhere um an obelisk that walter's gonna shit himself when he sees um but they like they he manages to like jerry rig this box to this obelisk um in, in a way that like will should allow them to like you to put these crystals in and like a large group of people to like bear witness like, to like a projector screen sort of like a projector screen except it's going to be in everybody's mind uh <laughs> this is gonna i, I this feel is like gonna make walter shit dirt I, I was gonna say i feel like <laughs> walter's like gonna like meet back with the group and we all converge and like he's gonna be little walter as a prank and then he's just gonna like he's gonna pass out as little walter <laughs> just because he sees this friggin obelisk that like I think he last saw uh, at the bottom of a friggin' lake. Yes. Uh, it, is, <laughs> it, is, it is definitely different, um, but it is a similar type thing as, like, the thing that you touched and it cursed you. 
Um, so that is kind of like the duration of your your guys' day. Um, if if nothing else needs to happen now, we will uh, we'll transition to the next day. Um, so we get a long rest and all of our hit points Everybody back. gets a long rest? Yes, we get your long rest. There's, there's probably a lot of convincing uh, Walter that it's actually safe and not super cursed. <laughs> uh, well, Walter's counterpoint is like he just points at his face a whole bunch. Like, <laughs> uh, Falkoff well, is like, don't worry, I'm not going to make you touch it. This is just like, this just turned into a Lovecraftian horror. Yep. <laughs> it really I is. Think, I, mean, I think Walter's experience was... has been a Lovecraftian horror this entire time. I mean, so far to what it sounds like, it sounds like a rad story, though. I think you should touch it, you know, <laughs> reveal that plot a little bit more. He's like, no, you don't, you don't need to touch it. Everyone will sit. We will turn it on. You will all be able to see. No one needs to touch. You can sit. That's fair. Your, That's your, fair. Your chairs. Yeah. Uh, so it essentially passes out sitting near the, the item. Like, she'll sleep, sure. but she's not, like... She's still not leaving the space. And That's fine, yeah. As as she like, when up, you wake up in the morning, like, Volodov is still there fucking around with it. You're like, you don't think he slept? He's just like, eh. <laughs> I, hey. um, I, I'm pretty sure uh, someone sent, back. like, uh, uh, some uh, for, like, coffee from Stanfield. It's like, I, no, yeah. I need the good stuff. <laughs> the real good stuff. <laughs> Talk to those wizards, butler. I need his coffee. Bring it to me. Uh, so... You guys, uh, um, Volodov accompanies you guys to uh, the chamber that you went in before, like, like the castle chamber. The Council of Eight files in. They are in their like multicolored, illusory, uh, person concealing garments. Um, they come in. He like begins setting this thing up. Um, uh, your grain comes. Uh, you know, is, is like brought to the chamber as well. Um, and as you guys settle in. Um, the like the, the chairperson of the the council of eight um like addresses you guys and, and says we have heard uh the brief uh recount of your exploits we know the the gist we know that there is a second dragon uh on the field now one that we are hoping will be on our side uh we know that Here's hoping, baby. We know that. I mean, the... at the very least, he was friendly to me. <laughs> they they kind of nod. They say, at the very least, um, if our reports are to believe, he deeply messed up Shivas and Varya on his way out. Um, yeah, have, that sounds uh, about right. Uh, we have some some reports from uh, contacts scattered across the continent. Uh, that indicates that the Silver Dragon is currently um, uh, in flight, riding uh, riding high air currents, um, making all due haste directly uh, south and southwest, uh, presumably in the direction of this city. Um, we are at this time choosing to believe that uh, when he gets here, he will aid in the defense of the city. Um, because the alternative is that uh, there is nothing any of us are going to be able to do to stop two dragons and an army. I, uh, I you got not, a point there. Yeah, I do not think that uh, he is coming as an enemy. If anything, uh, I'm hoping uh, uh, it will keep uh, the controlled red dragon... Uh, far from here. I don't think they wish to uh, risk losing that. Uh, Is there any word on the red dragon? Uh, our reports, and we believe them to be accurate, are that the red dragon is accompanying the Imperial Army on its way here. Really? It, I thought it was headed for Neveria. I thought it, it was, was in Neveria. Neveria. It has left Neveria with the army coming here. Ooh, you know, uh, Shithead did say that they didn't really need that plan anymore. Then yes, they would uh, then move to stop the next most dangerous thing, which would be an ALR just gestures broadly toward, uh, you know, around the room. Oh, I should have, let me ask this question. What do you guys do oh. with Claude uh, at this point? Like, where is he? Do you bring him to we this meeting? We, no, we would have sent him... 
I, I think we would have probably had him just go help or get. Uh, yeah, that's I, fine. I just, I just like, I just, I forgot that he yeah. was like around, and I was like, oh shit, we, I didn't uh, see. Him. I we'd set, him here. yeah, we'd set him up with a, a, you know, like a uh, room somewhere. And be like, okay, all right, no problem. So he's, yeah. Help he drinking cocoa bags. or something, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll let him watch Cocoa Melon on the on the obelisk. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's kind of a squire anyway. Just let him sure. do what he does. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, so the uh, the enchanter, uh, the the chairman of this this uh, the council of eight uh, says, all that aside, um, your mission was successful. You retrieved the chronomancy device, and if our guest Ygrain is to be believed. It is through this that we shall have all of our answers about the Brotherhood's plot and what their ultimate goals are. Um, she also like hoping that uh, Master uh, Zalzabeth, when he uh, arrives, might be able to give us a little more insight on this cult of the dragon as well, since they appear to be a third player on the field. Perhaps. Um, the Enchanter turns and says, uh, Lady Agrain, can you walk us through this device and let us begin and see what there is to be seen here? Um, Ygrain steps up and she says, Yes, I can. These, she brings out those crystals, these are crystallized shards of time. They can be made by taking an echo of a short span of time from a point in a person's life. Um, she says, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the means of doing so, of creating more of these, uh, has been lost to time. Um, the device itself, she like gestures to the box, um, it is used to transmit the moment of time contained within the shard into something else. Um, a conduit through which it is to be observed. This can be a person's mind, though that can be risky. Um, in discussing with your um, master artificer, um, it just so happens that you had in one of your archives uh, one of these obelisks. Um, they are used to serve as an intermediate um, in this case, we will allow it, uh, use it to allow everyone present to witness uh, the shards of time preserved within the relevant crystals. Um, she gestures Walter towards you. Um, she says, There are a number of items like this that have been found throughout. Uh, the continent and the isles. Many of them, we believe, were ancient versions of the Brotherhood attempting to preserve its message for future members. Many of them have become corrupted over time. She, like, points at your eyes. Um, she says, the Brotherhood's answer to this is that they have been tampered with. I have come to believe that the true nature of these messages uh, has become revealed over time. Their insidious nature has corrupted the obelisks, and that is what has cursed them. She points, like, to the one you have here. She says, these are, I can certify, safe. These are the ones that the Brotherhood has been making use of. They were stored within the Empire's archives uh, for safekeeping, um, unbeknownst to the Empire as to what their true nature was. How did we get one? I don't want to. That. I don't. I don't want the answer to answer that question. Don't one what? That. One of the obelisks? Yeah. No, like, uh, like, one's gonna, one's just gonna say that out loud. It's like, okay, this is like super secret tech, and like, you guys just casually have one in the basement. Uh, no, they, they'll answer that question. Um, the, uh, bu -bu 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 -bu, let's say the transmuter. Uh, it's on a loan. No, the transmuter says, um, we have a tremendous amount of stuff uh, stored here within Ladrius Keep and within the Ziggurat. Um, Don't say. Not all of it we 
know what it does or how to use it, or in the case of this, uh, we lacked any requisite uh, compatible ancient arcanotech to make it worthwhile. Um, so we, we uncovered this particular specimen uh, some uh, by a relic hunter some 60 years ago, and it's just been inert uh, in our stores until you brought us this, uh, which makes it a viable piece of, uh, of arcana to use. Walter's squinting, but he realizes people probably can't, can't tell. tell. <laughs> people. So, it's, so he just kind of gives up. It's like, all right, well, if if, you if we're all willing, to, it's, if you're all willing to gamble on this, I'll I'll join your gamble. Let's let's see what let's see what there is to see in this thing we've stolen. Uh, Let me stick my head in there. Uh, uh, Boris is like, no, I told you, you stay in your seat. You see it from your chair. <laughs> um. He cut it out, Boris. I'll do what I want. <laughs> and he has the crystals like in a like a little holder. Um, he's like, "This is the order that you uh, believe that they should be shown to everyone, Lady uh, Ukraine." Uh, she says, "Yes, that is the uh, the most relevant order to show uh, this information. It will, uh, I believe, give everyone present the most clear understanding of the origins of the Brotherhood of Artanis." Um, their current goals and perhaps some insight into what makes certain members of their organization so zealous once they have reached a certain uh, a certain level of trust within the group. Um, she takes the first crystal and she like slots it into the the slot in the the device, uh, the obelisk like. Thum, thrums to life and begins to like glow faintly um, and she says uh, prepare yourselves the experience can be intense you will witness these slivers of crystallized time as if you were the person from whom they were recorded this first one, and, like, you see that, like, the room around you begins to, like, dissolve, um, and, like, the scene begins to change and everything fades away, and, like, as her voice trails off, she says, You are seeing through the eyes now of the man who would become the first Artanis, the founder of the Brotherhood. And she vanishes, and you are seeing in like a first person perspective um you you see what she was talking about like this sliver of time like you you see it as if you are there experiencing it and you look to your left and you see a charred uh, swath of trees the burnt remains of a charred swath of trees and to the right you look at the crumbling and burnt out husks of several buildings the bodies of dozens of soldiers, two sets, armor and tabards emblazoned with emblems and colors of nations that you've never heard of, lay strewn about what was clearly a minor skirmish, now finished. Your line of vision turns downward as the man from whom uh, you see his perspective looks down, and you see that he is kneeling in the blood-stained dirt holding one of his fellow soldiers in his arms. The man is pale and sweating, a mortal wound in his torso. His eyes wander, and they find yours. You see that he's barely more than a boy. Fifteen, sixteen at most. He's frightened. He says something, and it's in a language that you don't recognize. But the tone is imploring. Reaching up, he grabs at something around your neck. A pendant, you see. A holy symbol. The young man clutches the holy icon in his hand as he dies. As the light leaves his eyes, his hand drops lifelessly to the ground. The chain around your neck snaps. You lift the, single, the symbol from his fingers and you hold it up, desperately uttering an incantation of some sort. There is a brief glow, but nothing more. Twice more you repeat the incantation, to no avail. 
You scream and you hurl the holy symbol with all of your might away from you and you begin to sob. You cry out. The language is foreign, but the meaning is clear. You are screaming at the gods, cursing them for their apathy to the suffering of your fellow mortals. And then a light pierces the smoke-choked sky. The clouds seem to part, and a figure is revealed to you. A dark silhouette, impossible to look at for the brilliant golden light that radiates around it. It speaks not with words that are heard by your ears, but a direct communication to the very soul. Language is transcended and the meaning is perfectly understood. The being tells you that it understands your pain. It tells you that your righteous hatred of the gods is justified, that they are capricious beings to whom your kind are nothing more than a means to an end. They are creators who, when given the chance to be benevolent to their progeny, to make them a world and a universe free of suffering and injustice, chose to continue their vendetta against their hated foe. All at the expense of all of existence. The being tells you that it knows you. It knows all of your kind. It has seen what you had the potential to become and what you were cursed to be because of the apathy and malevolence of its kind. It is a god, one of the first. One who dared to stand against its kind on behalf of their creations. For this, it has been cast to a place outside of the universe for all time but it has found a way to reach out from its prison back into the universe, a way to impart knowledge to mortal kind that they might free themselves of the yoke of the gods. You see a fortress, bigger than anything you've ever seen before, a structure bigger than a city, bigger than a mountain. You see a chamber deep within, so large that you cannot see the far side of it. You see an object, a gem, the most perfect stone imaginable. It shines and sparkles in every color and shade at once. The heart of the world, the entity tells you. The seed containing the planet's soul. The anchor connect that connects your plane of existence to the very lifeblood of creation. A way to harness creation for mortal kind and recreate reality as a utopia. You see visions of the world as it could be made, glimmering, Perfect cities, verdant, harmonious landscapes untouched by war, disease, famine, or death. A perfect world. The being reaches down and it takes you by the hand, lifting you to your feet. Claim the heart of the world and free your people. As the clouds roll back, the figure is obscured from your view. The blinding light is filtered down to individual beams. You look around as the beams fall to the ground, each landing on the body of one of the slain, not discriminating which emblem adorns their armor. You watch their wounds vanish, their eyes open as breath is returned to their lungs and life to their bodies. You look down. The young man who died in your arms is looking up at you, his eyes wide with wonder and with something else. Conviction. Your vision blurs again, reality changes, and you have a brief moment of vertigo as you stop being the first Artanis and you become yourself again. Uh, Walter is absolutely screaming. Uh, so, because like, you, like I, Walter, I feel like Walter has seen broken versions of these. You have seen, yes, you have seen this vision before, but you have seen the broken version of this vision. You have seen the version of your vision that Maka has told you is the truth. And that this was a lie. Yeah. Yeah, so Walter's Walter's probably like screaming screaming like just out loud, like, no, you're being tricked, like just just like ranting like a psychopath <laughs> and just like just like screaming his voice hoarse. Well, like well, when we snap back to reality. Well, well. Oh, easy, easy. The, um, I, I think, uh, the, b- 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 the necromancer, um, like, actually, like, hops down from their little, like, 
plinth thing and comes over and like kneels down by you walter and like puts a hand on your chest and they're gonna cast calm emotions um (laughs) and you hear like you hear like in a quiet voice you you hear them say to you be at peace everything will be fine So as he, as he comes down off that, it's like <laughs> I, I like he's he's probably gonna try to like gauge the reaction of the uh, the rest of the the group, and it's like I'm I'm sorry the I, I I saw the consequence of this. I think when I touched the orb the last time, I <clears throat> I don't know that I can handle too much more of this um i'm gonna stand from wherever i was sitting which i assume was not very close to walter i don't know what the setup was but i grab my chair and move so i'm sitting so goddamn close to walter it's (laughs) awkward because my aura of courage means he cannot be frightened oh there you go that's cool and it's not a guarantee considering we're all going into a mind warpy place but i am just <laughs> no i think that's really doing cool what i um, can you walter you like rowan comes and like sits down next to you and like you do kind of feel like okay it's you know and it and it, it's at first you know it, it is and and this is certainly part of it it is like the the sort of like calming steadying presence of somebody like coming next to you and like not you know they're not trying to like talk to you fuss with you it's just like a still presence beside you that like helps take the edge off and and as the as the necromancer like backs away you kind of feel the the initial like rush of adrenaline and and the like the calm emotion sort of like balancing each other out um you you can feel something else radiating from rowan and it is a it is a tangible power that you kind of realize like you feel a little bit better than you have in a while, uh, like sort of curse wise. Yeah, uh, yeah I had the to general talk to shittiness of this like whatever this thing is that's like burning you up um, feels better, and. Uh, Make a uh, make an insight check. Actually, I think it's a good place to maybe make somebody roll a die. <laughs> uh, maybe if it's against me, I'm failing. I'm no, damaged. just just it's against You're, yourself. Uh, against against myself. Uh, you can you can check you can check in the the roll log, but it's a right. uh, net twenty. <laughs> net twenty. The roll log. <laughs> <laughs> something like something like really clicks for you, uh, and you're like, God damn, I cannot believe I have not grilled her on this yet. You remember Maka's, like, Maka's instruction to you about, like, like save yourself, seek the dawn. That was the, the word she used was seek the dawn. Right. And you're like, oh, yeah, she's a paladin of the radiant dawn, and, like, their power comes from a thing called the star of dawn. And you're like, fuck, I should have asked that way sooner than this. (laughs) All right, I'll take it. Um, and you can feel something about this source of power that you know that Rowan wields as this like star, this star of dawn. Uh, like something about it is helping with like with the curse that is currently like eating away at you, uh, and that just like solidifies this thought in your mind. I just um, on the back a couple times, like not really hard, but just like still like very soldier like of like like the little rough kind of thing. Like you'll be all right. I'm still not saying anything, but when I catch Walter's spooky eyes, I'll just nod, and I'm yeah. Well, Walter will trying like, to indicate like we need to talk later. Yeah, Walter will like calm calm down a little bit, and I'll just like like slap his thigh like one or two times to like indicate like all right like um you grin the eyes. It's about as good right. as I'm gonna be able to get. So like let's all right spooky do spooky eyes. Let's go. <laughs> uh, Grain says there are. Uh, that's not her voice. Uh, she says there are. Th- Still four visions that I must show you for you to understand all of this. Steal yourself, and I think if it becomes too much for anyone, there is no shame in bowing out of the room. Walter's gonna, uh, just 
like pull a pull a belt out and just like bite into it and just <laughs> I'm going watch, to... and just and just like just like wait uh, wait for everything to start happening again i'm just gonna very quickly it's not gonna matter so much in the sense of mechanics but again for the sake of trying to help him uh, rowan's gonna hit and she doesn't she hasn't done this in so long because it's so tied to her past she's gonna hit walter with a plus which is really like for mechanic purposes in a fight is better but for sure. just this okay. moment of like cool. getting through this yep, sure. she's trying uh, to help him all right uh alar is also going to conjure scooter and direct him to uh do what he's done so often for alar himself curl himself basically around your shoulders okay i'll, I'll probably take scooter back off You're like thank you i think i think I'll, i think i'll be okay <laughs> i appreciate the attempt uh, okay. I like he's just gonna he's like he's like it's like just just gives a thumbs up and like just bites the belt again and just like hopes for the best she pulls right. the crystallized time sliver out of the device puts in the next one and your vision begins to change again this time your perspective is that of a young woman you are standing in the midst of a crowd in a dimly lit room you look down at your hands and you see that you're holding a red feather that somebody has handed you. Around the room, you see many of the other men and women wearing them in their hats or in their tunics, some in their hair. And then three people take a small stage at the front of the room. And a hush immediately falls over the crowd. The man in the center is relatively young. He is handsome. His hair is short, mousy brown, and tousled. His smile is warm, inviting, and understanding. He looks at the crowd, and a shiver rolls through them. His eyes are pure vanta black, with no hint of white sclera to be seen, and his irises are two luminous rings of pure silvery white. He opens his mouth, but just before he speaks, a door bursts open. A flood of torchlight streams into the room as dozens of soldiers pour in. Screams echo out as they draw their swords and begin massacring the crowd. You turn, you look, you see back to where the man with his silver eyes and his two companions stand. One of them is tugging at his arm, attempting to lead him away, but he doesn't budge. His face contorts in fury, and he explodes into a cloud of energy, which rushes through the fleeing, the fleeing crowd and reforms back into a man in front of the soldiers. The man with the silver eyes carries no weapons. He barely moves. Little more than a gesture of his hand, and the soldiers are blasted from the chamber. They crumple into dust as they hit the ground. The man with the silver eyes turns, and he looks at you. You realize that you had fallen to the ground at some point. He offers you his hand, and he helps you to your feet. He smiles, you, smiles at you in a way that lets you know that everything will be all right. The vision clears, and you return to the chamber of the Council of Eight. Grain is already, like, switching the crystals. She says, It is considered important. This is still not her voice. That's somebody else. <laughs> uh, she says, It is considered important to tell the tale of the Brotherhood's initial rise, you see, through these visions. From Artanis' initial encounter with the being that they look at as their god to their origins as a humble organization persecuted by the predominant forces of law and order in those days too what you will see follow she puts the next crystal in you see through the eyes of a man who appears to be sitting on a throne in a throne room He's surrounded by advisors, all of whom are clamoring at him at once. Panic and desperation are clear in their faces and their voices. Beyond them, a line of soldiers stands at the ready, facing towards the doors of the throne room. Outside, you hear a loud crash, the sounds of throngs of people all raising their voices. The clash of steel, the screams of the dying. The doors of the throne room crash once, twice, 
three times before the heavy wooden plank split and the door is bashed inwards. Hundreds rush into the room. At their forefront, warriors in mismatched armor. The armor of a rebel army. They wear red headbands or scarves, red feathers in their hair or swinging from their weapons. Behind them are the common folk, people armed with makeshift weapons or merely stones picked up from the street. The battle is brief. Your soldiers are overwhelmed. The dead are dragged from the center of the room. The crowd begins to part, and a man with black eyes lined with glowing silver rings steps to the front. A man and a woman flank him. The man carries a pair of shackles in his hand. The woman, an executioner's axe. The man with the silver eyes walks right up to you on the throne. The crowd of your nobles part, shrinking away from you. The man with the silver eyes steps up before you and opens his arms, palms up. It almost seems as if he means to embrace you at first. Do you realize no? These gestures towards the shackles or the axe, giving you a choice. The vision fades. Your brain is switching crystals. She says, It is said that the original Brotherhood, still not her voice, I don't know why I keep going into Mishkalanti of Kal Rook's voice. Uh, she says, It is said that the original Brotherhood rose to prominence, overthrowing uh, a prominent kingdom and claiming uh, its power as its own before it would spread through many of the other kingdoms in the region, amassing supporters for their cause. She places the next crystal in, and she says, it culminated in this. As the fourth vision uh, takes hold of you. You realize that you are on a ship. Uh, you are emerging from below decks, making your way towards the prow of the vessel. The man with the silver eyes is there. He wears a simple black garments with a red scarf tied around his throat. You join him and you gaze out, seeing that ahead of you is an armada. Ships of many different nations and types outfitted for war all flying a red flag, sail towards a fortress, one you recognize from the very first vision, when you look through Artanus' eyes at the vision shown to him by a god. The fortress is an island unto itself in the vast sea, so tall its spires vanish into the clouds. Between your armada and the island is another fleet, mismatched and slapdash as your own, the flags they fly are white, with six interlinked rings of gold on them. Your fleet is larger by far, but at the leading edge you see already that the battle is ferocious. Ships on both sides burn. Riders on Wyvern back and Griffin back collide, skirmishing high above. And then the dragons. The great creatures descend from the clouds, raining fire upon your ships, which attempt to fire harpoons at them and drop them from the sky. You look at the man with the silver eyes, and he observes with a placid assurance. He moves from the prow towards one of the ballistas. With a gesture, he dismisses the crew and takes control of the weapon himself. He turns it, angles it, aims the bolt high, and then he waits. You watch as he ignores the dragons, which continue to wreak havoc. He scans the skies, looking for something. Something else. You look as well. Following his gaze when he finds what he has been seeking. Small enough that you can hardly see them. Three dark shadows emerge from the fortress. They appear no larger than a person, but they soar through the skies like winged demons on tenebrous black clouds which swirl out behind them. You watch as they collide with your airborne forces and lay waste to them on a scale even beyond the mass of reptilian dragons. The silver-eyed man makes an adjustment to the ballista, eyes tracking the three dark streaks in the sky. He lays a hand on the projectile and you watch as it begins to vibrate, almost seeming to become less than solid. The silver-eyed man fires, the weapon thunks, 
and you whip your head skyward to watch its trajectory. The bolt collides with one of the three dark shapes, which begins to tumble, falling hundreds of feet and splashing into the water below. The other two forms stop, watching the third fall. When it hits the water, a wail echoes across the battlefield, a primal shriek of rage and loss. You find yourself dizzy suddenly. You are falling. As the deck rises up to meet you, you lose consciousness, and you awake back in the chamber of the Council of Eight. Uh, I think Walter's... You have seen crying. this one as well. <laughs> I say, Walter, Walter's actively crying for this one. <laughs> it's, instead, of, instead of, like, flipping out, he's just like... Make another insight check. I, th I, think, I think Jason just put two and two together. <laughs> uh, let's, let's see if Walter can do the same. Oh, that's a two. Okay. Uh, actually, this in this instance, I think all of you could make an insight check if you would like to. Wait, no, I'll be fair. Roll it, D&D Beyond. Definitely. Nat natural 20, baby, made him the 24. <laughs> Definitely I got... me rolling a four, so... Uh, I, I think, I think Walter's... I shit. I think Walter's still weeping, he just doesn't understand sure. why. Dirty 20. Dirty 20? Any other? And uh, seven. Brom got a 24. Okay. The dirt, so, the uh, dirt man. <laughs> so Brom and Rowan, you guys are the only ones who notice this. Um, Walter is like, Walter's crying. Uh, and that's distracting a lot of people. Naturally. Um, <laughs> We're uh, crying, people looking at us. You, your, like, attention is caught out of the corner of the eye, and you look up to the Council of Eight, and... You, so subtly that you, like, unless you had just caught it, you wouldn't have even noticed it. You see beneath their, like, hooded robe, the diviner goes... <laughs> and then, like, returns to their stoic position. Uh, I think Ygrain is, like, waiting to, put, like, with the last one, while, like, the, the like, bedlam that the, this last one set off has, like, is going on, so she'll wait for y'all to, like... <laughs> Who were those three? Uh, he asked the question of Ygrain, since uh, like, he assumes that she knows... The, uh, the she's three in the this. sky? Yes. She says, uh, she says, I do not know. Still not my well, voice. This is going to be my voice now because I can't stop it. <laughs> That's all right. Walter's, <laughs> Just, Walter's going to, like, when he asks that, he's going to, like, rub his tattoo, his, his brand, and say, uh, I, I think I know, but it's not time yet. Alar bristles a little bit at that one uh, <laughs> because it seems like uh, everything's like proper time, proper time. We're getting, <laughs> we're, it's getting mighty <laughs> fucking late. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, ready. ready. Uh, um, Grain holds up the final crystal, and she goes, "I will tell you. I will tell you what I know. I'm committing. This is my voice now. I will tell <laughs> you what I know." <laughs> um, she says, "I have not seen the contents of this time crystal." This has been in the Brotherhood's possession for, if legend lore is to be believed, uh, near on a myriad of years. Multiple millennia. Each time a new Artanis takes up the mantle, they bear witness to what is on this crystal. What I have shown you before this hopefully explains the Brotherhood's origins and the events that led to their rise and the culmination of their plot originally. I believe this will answer the question of what they have done since and what their goals are now. I believe that this crystal holds the answers that will allow you finally Try and outmaneuver them. 
He just like gives you guys a second. She says, "Remember, I haven't seen it, so if it's real fucked up, I can't be held responsible." <laughs> Uh, and she takes it and she slots that final. Oh, question. really? <laughs> this is not my fault. I put my hand on Walter's shoulder as a sign of like, I'm literally like, to try to anchor him <laughs> physically somehow. Even though we're all gonna go loopy loop, but I just am concerned. <laughs> um, you are looking into the eyes of the young man whom you witnessed resurrected by Artanis, uh, or by the Artanis is God in that first vision. Uh, he's older though. Um, but it is clear that it is the same the same man. As he shifts and your perspective sort of shifts, you realize actually that you are looking into a mirror. Your perspective is this man, Artanis' first follower. He speaks to his own reflection and by proxy to you, the witness of this moment in time, thousands of years later. His voice is soft and a little hoarse. You realize you don't understand the words he's speaking, per se. The language is alien to you. But somehow all the same, you can understand him. The same way that you could understand the voice of the god that spoke to Artanis. We are defeated. And in our defeat, the world is sundered. The Exarchs rallied a force against us. The gods' champions somehow convinced the dragons to join them. The battle was calamitous, but nothing compared to the aftermath. We made landfall at the Fortress Glower, last bastion of the primordials at the end of the dawn war and sole means of accessing the chamber of the world heart artanis went in alone we attempted to hold the line but the exarchs themselves were upon the field and followed after him i know that artanis reached the world heart but the exarchs must have interceded mere moments before he could harness its power through their act, the resulting devastation has brought ruin to all. The Fortress Glower was destroyed. The epicenter of the sundering of the planet, which threw so much matter so high that it has been captured by the heavens and now cloaks our world in a ring of debris. An ever-circling graveyard to the civilization that we knew that will loom above our children's 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 head for all time. The Exarchs must have banished Artanis somehow to the place where our god is imprisoned. Where he is now, neither his mind nor body nor soul are within reach of any magic we possess. He is lost to us. But we are still here. And hope is not lost to finish his work. There are things I must relate to you, who will witness this many years after my bones are long since turned to dust. Means to complete the work. The world is ended, but there are survivors, and among them those who know Artanis' truth. Civilization must rebuild, and we must put a thumb on the scales to ensure that the right steps are taken. A storm rages now, around the ruins of Glaur, hundreds of miles across, imbued with a malevolent magic. It is impassable by any means short of a, a teleportation magic of unimaginable power. The means and the knowledge of this magic is known in my time, but the infrastructure is gone. It will take hundreds, maybe more years, for the world to rebuild itself to a point where a suitable means of reaching Glower once more might be constructed. It will be the duty of Artanis' brotherhood to ensure that this comes to pass. Look here. And he turns his gaze, similarly turning your viewpoint, to a chalkboard, which is in the small room in which he is sitting. On it, 
diagrams and arcane formulae are visible. This is a sending chamber, a means to breach the arcane storm and reach the eye, where the ruins of Glower and the site of our greatest defeat rest. This is the first thing our brotherhood must see come to pass, the construction of at least one of these sending chambers. Secondly, the dragons and the exarchs, in the moment that Artanis was banished as the world began to sunder, completed a working of chronomancy so powerful that it encompassed the entire chamber of the world heart. We have dubbed it time locking. It may be the only thing that holds the world together, but it also prevents any from reaching the world heart and completing Artanis's work. This feat was achieved through the use of an arcane artifact known as an Orb of Dragonkind, a crystallized soul of a draconic ancient infused with the power of a god. Only a similar power can allow the barrier of stopped time to be passed, allowing for entry into the chamber. The metallic flights band together and created the barrier. Their orbs are lost. But the, drag, uh, but the vile, draconic, uh, chromatic dragons refused to join in the Exarch's fight. The chromatic orbs of dragonkind remain in the world. The chromatic dragon flights have taken them and jealously hidden them away, guarding them, keeping them out of anyone's hands but their own. This is the second thing our Brotherhood must see done. An orb of dragon kind must be secured. The chromatics will not give it up willingly. It may be required that they be hunted in an orb found by force. May it take ten thousand thousand years, I swear now, of the brotherhood of my friend, of my savior, will survive. We will see these goals achieved that we might finish what was started. The world I have known is gone, and with it, so is the man that I was. Instead, I will honor my friend. I will carry his mantle, and those who follow after me will ensure that he lives on through them until we can see his noble goal achieved and bring freedom and harmony to the world by any means necessary. And the vision fades, and you are back in the chamber of the Council of Eight for the final time. Uh, ALR thinks back. That chamber that we entered uh, underneath Noveria all those months ago. Now, probably about two years. Looks a hell of a lot like the diagram on the board that you just saw in that vision. The star, the thing beneath Noveria, the star spire. We've been in that chamber before. Oh, no wonder they want to take it over. It's underneath Neveria, underneath the Star Spire. That. That's their sending. There's another. Where? Suspected. The island of Glasgow. They wanted to take it back. The pirates disbanded. They didn't want the innocents to be killed, but there was interest in the island and a creepy little child who could see things that we can't understand told us that there were sending caves and then we had to leave I don't know if they found it I don't know if it's even works but there was suspicion there was one there too uh, Walter's gonna look directly at Ygrain and like did you did they find and then like he's gonna like address the rest of the council did any of you find these dragon orbs is that a thing you have laying around in the basement <laughs> uh, <laughs> Boris is like oh yeah look I juggle with them sometimes <laughs> uh uh, they they like they shake their heads. Um, Rowan just looks pale, <coughs> than usual, and 
uh, looks at your grain. It's what my former ally has, isn't it? That lets him control the red. She nods. Uh, she says, yes, as I told you, the dragon is a byproduct. Uh, the fact that they are sending it here to attack this city may be nothing more than a red herring. What they need is the orb to bypass the time lock, it seems. To get into the world heart chamber. They've had the orb for how long? A couple weeks. A few weeks. Question. And, uh, and Pendragon has his vessel. We don't know if the vessel has anything to do with this at this point other than Pendragon's psychotic mind, but yeah, we have to be worried about that too. He needed something to transmit a great deal of energy. Chances are it's to power that sending uh, device. We need to get back into Noveria. It's either that or we tr uh, try our luck in a uh, place where we don't even know whether the sending uh, device is intact. That one I know is. I've been there. I can take us right there. To the sending? At least to the chamber outside of it. I think that's where we were. We don't know what will uh, be waiting for us in there. Chances are it'll be uh, the Brotherhood's best. This is something they've been working for for before the uh, founding of the uh, Invarian Empire. They aren't going to uh, leave anything to chance. Walter's going to like rub his arm again. He's going to respond with uh, and for just as long, people have been working against them. How soon is the siege here expected? Um, the Enchanter says, uh, we expect that their troops will arrive on our borders within a ten day. Got some spell scribing to do. Um, the enchanter says we need to we need to consider the facts. The Brotherhood has manipulated the Ignean Empire to serve their purposes, that they might secure. We believe a power source to activate this star spire beneath the capital city of Neveria, which will allow them to send someone to this glower. They have control of the chamber itself as their uh, overthrowing of, of Mithlin Day's government was successful. And they have an orb of dragon kind. And yet... It seems that they have not done anything. Yeah, they're still coming here, and I want to know why. Perhaps there is more to this puzzle than we are understanding. Perhaps they don't know how to activate the Star Spire? Or perhaps this conduit, this energy source of theirs, has not arrived? And the, um, the abjurer, uh, speaks up and says, Be that it is, as it may, we need to figure out what our plan of attack is going to be. He points to you, he says, You said you can transport your strike team into this chamber. To what end? What is the goal? If we relieve them of the orb of dragon kind, is that sufficient to thwart their plans? It's the only one in the world, yes, presuming that we can destroy it. 
the let's see who's the right, Walter's Walter's gonna about to say something Go ahead. that is that is not morally correct based on LR's response. Uh, Walter is going to speak up and say, um, "What if the reason?" that they left that key to get through and not permanently blocked it was that that is our our win condition just as much as it's theirs we can you want to send one of us we can remake the world and undo the nonsense You're not technically wrong, I don't think. Mortals playing gods. That's what we've been dealing with this whole time. Mortals who don't want to play gods. Best person to have power is the person that doesn't want it. How fast can a dragon fly? How fast can that dragon get here? Which dragon? The, the red, red one or the silver one? The red. <laughs> um, the, uh, the transmuter um, says, like, uh, this is all strictly theoretical, as uh, we don't have a lot of data on the maximum uh, airspeed velocity of an unladen <laughs> dragon. But my guess would be, uh, based on the timing of your reports of when it was loosed from the volcano and when we believe it arrived in Neveria, um, a dragon could span most of the width of the continent in little more than uh, a few days. It is likely... Uh, and our reports back this up, the pace at which the Red Dragon approaches is hindered by the fact that it is staying with the army that moves on foot. Understandable. They wouldn't want to risk uh, it going on ahead and I understand. us getting lucky. Which means just... Arthur can get here. Yeah, Arnold not Arthur, is it? It's Arnold. Arnold. <laughs> well, te Te technically, his like... name is Zalzaveth, but uh... <laughs> I say I, I think I think Walter's consistently hey, been bromming this name up like real bad. Uh, uh, call him what I called him, Walter, Mister Z. Mister Z. Uh, well, Mister Z should be here faster, as he's not restrained by. So the abjurer, the abjurer says, it Flesh. seems to my ear that we have two, two approaches here, possible to take. What we've been discussing, we go there, we try to beat them in a head-on confrontation, take the tools that they've obtained from them. At the very least, stop a bunch of maniacs from getting into this heart of the world chamber, so that cooler heads might be able to figure out what to do. Or... We need to find a way to beat them to the punch. Clearly, something is stalling them. Which means we still have time to try and find some tools of our own. Rom. Sounds like we have a heist on our hands. When we went down there... You... you found a... note? Music? I did. I will... Braun probably has that on him. Yeah, he's stuff somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You, like, throw a bunch of, like, wigs and scarves and stuff yeah. out of your bag until you come up with the sheet music. There it is. Wait, which one are we talking about? The one I the one I found, or the one that the one that uh, was given one, to the, the one you... gave you? Uh, okay, because we found magical sheet music in a cave. 
cave. You found magical sheet music in a cave. You used you did use that to open a big to open a big Artanite okay. door that had sealed <laughs> the uh, the chamber into the Star Spire uh, sub chamber. Yes. Yeah, so which one are we talking about? The found one or the given one? Well, we know the found one gets us into the inner chamber, at least. Yeah. Uh, the I guess the given one. Maybe Renard right Isengrim here. told you that like that will. In in typical fashion of this campaign, they're like, "This will be important later," but we're not going to yeah. tell you why. <laughs> so you have that one, but you don't know what it's for. Okay, so we're talking about the one I found currently. Um. But one that that's the one, one that Alar knows about. He might probably didn't remember you getting one from Ice and Grim. So was uh, I, that... yeah, was anybody else there for that? I don't remember. Couldn't tell you at this Maybe point. Maybe you should pull out both and explain the exact story right now. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I tell them about. I have both. Which sheet music? This sheet music. That sheet music. This sheet music. A call shoots. Um, <laughs> Walter pulls out "Baby Don't Hurt Me" by Nice yeah. Newsberry, signed copy. Yeah. Um. What are you thinking, Alar? Well, uh, Adam is trying to remember whether or not he was around when Sinclair was talking with Ron about, hey, have you noticed that your two mentors don't seem to age? And I don't think he was there, so it doesn't No, matter. I think that was that a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Ron okay. Sinclair convo. Um, so I think I think when Walt, when when Brom pulls out both, we're gonna like all point at like the one that we know he had. Yeah, and it's like, what the hell? Where did, that one? Yeah, where did you get this one? Uh, Reynard and Nigel Grimm gave it to me, and they just said with Hold with uh, in true fashion of uh, this will be important later. You'll know when to use it. We're not gonna tell you anything else. Walter's gonna like look at the the eight. So whether that's right now or an even yeah, further. Walter's later. gonna look up at the counts. Like you don't have any music mancers up there, do you? Anybody that can help translate this to see how important it is. It. Trans music. It's musical notes. You don't translate it to anything. You, it's music. Says one of the council of eight. <laughs> what does it mean? Like what? I don't understand. I think he's trying to say, do you have anybody that can determine what this can do? What this does? I'm sure because we can use uh, the. Uh... I haven't tried to play it in case it like opens a volcano or something. <laughs> the uh, the enchanter is uh, the enchanter is like. Um, yeah, uh, yes, I suppose we could we could take a look at it. What did what did you say the one the other one did that you found? It opened a door. Open a door. Uh, in the star spire. In the star spire. True Goonies fashion. Like, nod, which I use. Like, Walter is a chair. Nods, <laughs> there's some nods. The uh, the conjurer says, uh, "Well, if the star spire was uh, created by the Invarian Empire, um, under influence of the Brotherhood of Artanis manipulating them, it it makes some sense that an uh, an Artanite uh, piece of music opened the." It was involved in the locking mechanism. Um, we can certainly look at this one and see if we can figure out if, if there is any sort of enchantment woven into the, the harmonics of the music. Um, though, uh, whether we can determine that, or if, if we can, determining what it might do is entirely up in the air. And may well require more time than we have. So the short answer to that question is no. So Walter's gonna like short pipe up maybe. and say, "Okay, uh, we had when we got into <clears throat> the area under the Star Spire, there was a second dome, I believe, that we had no way to open at the time." Yes. What about second dome? Ah, second dome. <laughs> Uh, unless I'm remembering it incorrectly, I believe that is the yeah. There was there was like a thing inside, uh, and it was inert, uh, and yeah. you like couldn't figure uh, yeah. out what you're supposed to do with it. Why don't wait? I here's a wild idea. We have access to translocative magic. Why don't we go get your two mentors and ask them directly? What the hell is this music? Do we have two days? Putting a lot of faith 
in uh, them being willing to tell us. The hour's getting mighty uh, dim. If this is something that is important and uh, if, look, a dragon pretended to be a halfling. I mean, I could contact them at the very least. I don't have to go to... Yeah, a sending like spell at on. least. I'm one of the sending scrolls that I have. Are you just you just been, like, spending your days, like... Kind of I'm basically no, going to see if somebody here um, essentially has the power to yield uh, Zoom call them. Sure. Yeah. You can yield Zoom call them. Right? I like to use the obelisk. Some, okay. one, of these, one of the people in this room can for sure send them ascending right now if well, that's what you want to do. I'm going to say, I'm not, Brahm is not going to do it with other people around. Oh, okay. Like, maybe that, like, the party, but Bron is not doing it say, with this Bron gaggle of fuckers I mean, around. Well, there, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, there's a bookkeeper office in the city, so you can send a message to them, uh, to, uh, to Isengrim and, uh, No, I'm looking for essentially, like, a, like, a face-to-face, like, we do with the mirror. Uh, what I'm getting at yeah. is there, is, uh, there would be a contact mirror in, uh, the bookkeeper's office there. Yeah, so. whatever. Basically, Brahm is going to have a face-to-face -face meeting, but he's not doing it with the Council of okay. High High Holy Whatever's here. <laughs> Council of Eight, the Ardenum Libri. Uh, okay, yeah, no problem. Geography question. And maybe also if we're going to raise What's-His-Face, we talk to him first. Sure. <laughs> question. On the map of our lovely land that we're running around in. Uh -huh. I can't remember shit that if it's not marked. Uh, so, am I correct in remembering that Terra Libra is the red dot to the left of Festenhaust? Hang on, I'm trying to pull up the... Uh... I'm trying to remember where the hell I am. I believe so... in Lore Dump, if you uh, Yes, to, th so the short, short version of that is, yes, the the red dot to the to the west of Festenaust, which is on the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody can see it, but it's sort of yeah. uh, yonder. Yeah. Uh, over further, but a little bit that way. Is that is terribly where that is where you guys currently are? I can zoom out okay. the map so you can see a better. Uh... And just to see if I remember everything correctly, and I think I do. Where I first met Malark wasn't far from Festenaust. Vernon Hearth wasn't that far. Before. Uh, yeah, w would have been would have been generally in that in that vicinity, probably further south around the south part of Lake Malamir here, because um, you're from Austinvale, which is down here. Yeah. So you met Malark like Hold on, on your way. journey, mm -hmm. like from Austinvale down here, like north and then up and then around these mountains and then heading that way up to sort of like the top ish left is is a. Uh, where Lyra is remember. up there over my shoulder. Okay. Just trying to remember my trauma locations. Your geography of this uh, imaginary land of wonder. Yeah, that is a good point. The people in Fessen asked, uh gotta be like shaking their boots right now because the, <laughs> the army's like heading right towards them. Yeah, that's kind of like where my brain is at right now and also my brain because be of fine. everything happening is like his hometown isn't far <coughs> and like just my brain starting to do some stupid ideas that she will never actually do but Rowan's debating some dumbass shit but she's not gonna do anything out loud you know? hmm? it'll be fine it'll be fine um <coughs> and I think uh, at this point uh we have some calls to make, and we have a staff to test. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure who you want uh, present when we actually give this thing a try. But uh, hey, why don't we why don't we raise Sinclair and introduce and reintroduce new Sinclair to Isengrim? Be a nice reunion. Uh, that's what I'm thinking as well. Uh, Start start on a positive note, and on the world ending stuff. 
Yeah, yeah, you always want to leave with the good news. Well, I don't know that they're going to find him being uh, alive or Rihanna gets good news. I don't know if they were friends. All right, well, the not terrible world-ending news. that That's good by, uh, you know. At the very least, I want to ask Sinclair some stuff before I, some more stuff if I go and talk to Bernard and Isagrim. Okay, well. And he's going to owe us after we bring him mm -hmm. back from the great beyond. Walter's going to look at him dead in the face and say, no. <laughs> Just no. Rom? You do it as a favor, I... you don't do it at all. Uh, I'm holding the staff. If he's going to owe anybody, it's me, and I'm not holding a debt on him. It'll be a handshake. Yeah, but I'm saying thing. he's going to. He's going to be more inclined to be more less cryptic uh, and be more straightforward after we brought him back from death. One would hope. He wasn't right. particularly cryptic when you dealt with him in uh, no. the Esselgath. He was more, like, around here he was more like, listen, this is what they told me. Uh, and I don't know shit, but like they said you're important, so I this is what I did. He was basically like, hey, Brom, you're the chosen one. And then he's he the chosen, yeah. They said you're the chosen one, so <laughs> good luck. Brom, you're the chosen one. <laughs> chosen one. I'm the chosen one. <laughs> um, then. He wouldn't just say, ah. Uh, he would just call him, ah. Uh, he would just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I look uh, at the council okay. and Ukraine, and I wait for them to react to our scattered conversation yeah, it's hard to read it's hard to read a, a bunch of like hooded faceless uh people but you, you definitely get the sense that they're like these are the idiots saving us <laughs> I, I, I definitely I, heard I, the I, windows I think... xp shut down theme at least twice <laughs> on yes. that i'm like brom will turn to them and be like look we're like fighting off the apocalypse and everything and all that could we maybe cut the whole, like, spooky hooded, ooh, nobody knows who I am thing? Like, seems like a lot of unnecessary steps. Make a persuasion check. I'm gonna roll physical dice this time. Ah, uh, yes, the all ones d20. <laughs> Listen, uh, he's, he's still he's somehow a 14. I said, those are my DM dice. I can't roll those. It's illegal. <laughs> Roll my Brom dice. Was a what? Persuasion, you said? Yeah. Twenty-three. I shouldn't have let Brom make a persuasion check. It's a plus six. But I rolled Seventeen. You only have a plus six to persuasion. Yeah, no, it's he's a liar, not a, uh, uh, a soothsayer. Performance is twelve. Uh, intimidation you know is twelve. Deception is twelve. Yeah, he, he's a liar and a uh, you know a brawler. He's not. I a... usually persuade people by with violence yeah. uh, as opposed to actual persuasion. Gonna uh, persuade you one d eight at a time. <laughs> so. They, uh, they, like, kind of look to each other, um, and then they, they start to, like, have a, have, like, a conversation about it, um, you know, and, like, you, you kind of get the, the array of the, the opinions. One of them is, like, this has been the tradition since the founding of the Ordinum Libri, and, you know, this is intended to, uh, keep us from uh, abusing our positions and blah 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 blah, blah and uh, yeah, this, that, in that prom interrupts and goes oh, all right hold on show of hands who already kind of knows who every each one of you is like who is able to <laughs> make another it? persuasion <laughs> check <laughs> another persuasion check yeah <laughs> uh, alar's just gonna point at the diviner i know you figured out at least three of them uh dirty 20. Uh, uh, actually sorry 20, 21. every Every single member of the Council of Eight, except for the Evoker, raises their hand, uh, and the illusion, is, the illusion is just goes like, <laughs> I, I risked my case. Um, the Abjurer is like, it's 
principal, damn it! Like you and your principals um, are gonna waste time. The <laughs> well, uh, when the end of the world is on the line, I don't need to have to wait for you to put your freaking mask and robe on before the, uh, we have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the the enchanter, the enchanter is like. Would it help that, if we swore ourselves to secrecy? Uh, they say, like, Would it help if we wore my skin robe? <laughs> Actually, I have a counter offer. Since we're probably going to die doing this, doesn't matter if we know. <laughs> uh, the, the More says, importantly, <laughs> the enchantress is like, shut we don't the care. fuck up! I'm trying to talk! <laughs> <laughs> I've been with these guys for three weeks, and I've lost my damn mind. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 Uh, and they go. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't say anything. Yeah, they're they're like they're like you. You're good. We like you. The rest of you, shut up. <laughs> he's got the uh, many things in his pocket. The, yeah, yeah. As he's like as he's like thumbing through the cards. Yeah. Um, the enchantress is considering that the city is about to be under siege, and it is going to take every capable arcanist to unleash their full power. I think it may become a moot point very soon. And they gesture. The fool's errand do have a point. If at this point we have not earned the level of trust to do away with the formalities of the council's uh, statute of anonymity, then we are simply standing on tradition at the uh, sake of expediency for no reason. We should put it to a vote and be done with it. And uh, the enchanter says, All those in favor of uh, temporarily lifting the statute of an anon anonymity amongst the Council of Eight and including the members of the Fool's Errant, uh, Master Boris Volodov, uh, and she says, like, uh, Ukraine will need to leave the chamber, of course. Um, in our confidence. And, uh... Walter the, raises his hand. The, <laughs> the Enchanter, <laughs> the Illusionist, the Diviner, the Evoker, and the, uh, Transmuter, uh, raise their hands. I, the Abjurer, the Conjurer, and the Necromancer, uh, vote nay. Um, and the Enchantress says, uh, with a vote of five to three, four, the motion passes. And I hereby declare the lifting of the statute of anonymity uh, in a temporary measure until the current crisis at hand is averted. And uh, they, like, lift their hands up and, like, kind of make a this motion. Uh, and it, like, pulls the illusion of this, like, cowled figure away from each of them, revealing, like, who they are. Um, you want to play a game uh, where you guys guess who's who? Sure. Yeah. Okay. You haven't met all of these people, so it's sort of not fair. I like games. Don't I was going to say, uh, we're, all, we're all staring at the Diviner. <laughs> as yeah, I know. Yeah. Before, before he takes his mask off. We also think we were pretty sure we figured out the necromancer a long time ago. So okay, yeah. so Scooby mysteries over the here. The abjurer uh, removes their uh, their cow. Any guesses on the abjurer? You have met the abjurer. <laughs> Not Volodov. No, because he's no. in the room. Oh, no. Yeah, he's in the room. Like, oh damn! Yeah, yeah I know. I, I, <laughs> crazy. I, I'm running through. I'm running through the names I remember. Um, three. three like a cow wearing an eye patch. That's exact. What did you say? It's three what? Three legged possum wearing an eye. It patch. is a three legged possum wearing an eye patch. No, uh, this, is, this is a pretty obscure one. Uh, it is a it is a dragonborn, uh, who you uh, you will recall. Uh, this is Vrasic Sharpclaw. Uh, you I have had a like conversation him. that you have had with him. He is uh, he is in charge of the Ziggurat. Mm, okay. uh, that that tracks. If, yeah. if Riker is on this council, I'm leaving. <laughs> Uh, the evoker, <laughs> the evoker, pulls his mask, uh, and it is Riker. Uh, all right, I'm he's, he's like, "Hey guys!" <laughs> uh, Alar grabs from as he's leaving. Sit down. <laughs> That's Walter's, what he did. Like, like, like what before Riker. he did that? Riker's like, "I'm on the Council of Eight. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the enchanter who still has their mask on says, 
Uh, yes, uh, Riker is the single most powerful evocation wizard uh, that has ever lived. That. Uh he's like he like his little like his little iron giant eyes go like and he goes like he goes like i cast a fireball that blew up a whole building one time (laughs) um the the conjurer reveals uh their identity this is not a a person that you guys have met before it is a uh, female high elf um she introduces herself to you as amelie de sandre um, the, uh, the necromancer reveals his identity. Uh, you guessed that one. That is Sandra Darquette. Um, yeah, Spooky McSpook Pants. We figured it out. Spooky, Spooky <laughs> McSpook Pants. The head of the Medica like, is the necromancer. Kind of a bitch. He's like, hi. Um, the mm. illusionist reveals their, their identity with, like, a flourish. This is another person who you have not met. Um, he is a half-elf. He is in, like, uh, he is in, like, a... He's Prince. Just imagine okay. that. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> He's in like purple a purple rain. suit. Yeah. Purple <laughs> He's purple rain. rain prince, basically. Um, he introduces ba- himself uh, purify as... Purify myself in the lake, uh, yeah. waters of the lake. He has an ankh around his neck. He introduces himself as Florian Vane. Which one was he? He's the illusionist. The illusionist. So he's he's the the uh, illusionist formerly known as. Blaine. He's the illusionist formerly known as <laughs> Florian Vane. Um, the enchanter uh, reveals their identity. The enchanter is Mishkalantia Kalruk. Okay. Uh, the transmuter rev- rev- uh, reveals their identity. They're, besides Rikers, theirs is like the most uh, severe. As, like, Riker took his hood and robe off and got, like, way bigger and turned into a robot. And as uh, the transmuter, like, pulls their cowl away, they go, like, it's Shoop! And it's Nuri it's Rattlesnap. Nuri. <laughs> He's like, hey! Walter goes, <laughs> see your, see your goes, ah, beans. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, why you were in that mirror when we called from the Viria. She's like, eh, guilty. Um, then I guess right. Of course, last but not least, the diviner dramatically reaches up, pulls their cowl away, uh, and it is a face that you don't recognize. Is it it? Uh, everybody make an insight check. Natural 20. Fuck you, Anna. Imme- immediately you're like, does he have a minor illusion on? And he's like, ah! And he like, drops it, and it's turning <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Well, Like, Walter's, Walter's like, wait a second. He's like, huh, who would have thought? And he sees, like, he sees, like, Rowan, like, like, staring at him real hard. And, and he, like, like, yeah, he, like, drops the illusion, and it's Torian Injured, and he's like, ah. Son of a bitch. God <laughs> damn it. Well... Taylor just raises that, his hand. He, uh, so he looks, uh, I, actually, I... I, I he does, he does, like, he does that bit, uh, but, like, as he drops it away, you see that it was, like, he it was very much, like, he went through the motions because, like, he kind of felt like he had to. It, like, clearly his heart was not in it. He still looks <laughs> terrible, like, <laughs> yeah. he's just, like, sunken. He yep. looks tired. I, I like to think that that happens, and then everybody, but mainly, like, Brom and uh, Oz have a moment where they're, like, <laughs> they try and remember back all of the shit talking they've done to the Trinity. Oh, what did you say? Aylor just raises a hand. Are we still on a path? He says, "Yes." He says, "That's all I need to know." It's going Thank very you. well. Okay. Hey, so, uh, no hard feelings? <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> hey, hey, just, he just so, slowly lowers his head to the well, table. Anything I may have said behind your back is something I would have also said in front of your face. You <laughs> exactly, <there>. exactly. <laughs> Jesus, it's, it's, it's fine. I know what you're about. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you know what you're about. <laughs> this is, I also know Fucking what I'm weirdo. about. I know, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. It's fine. Oh goodness! Um, so like, uh, as 
all of that is finally completed, uh, Mishka Lantia. So now their voices, like, return to, like, they're, they're not modulated anymore, so, so, like, their true voices come out, uh, you know, as, as Mishka Lantia is like, there, now, now that I, the correct character, can finally do this voice, uh, now that we have resolved this, um, we should uh, make a definitive plan as to what the next step is going to be. Um, I think, uh, and then she is cut off as, like, an alarm, it's like basically like an arcane, like, alarm klaxon goes off. Um, and everybody, like, looks, and then they look to Vrasic Sharpclaw, uh, and he's, he, like, snarls, and he's like, somebody has broken into the ziggurat. Aylor is out of his chair, and he's already... Uh, yeah, you guys, like, jump to your feet. You see, like, most of the Council of Eight, at, before they start moving, like, they swing, and they look at Torian, and Torian is like... So he didn't Fucking know? befuddled. Uh, uh, and, nope. like, when you see that, like, then you see the Council is like... Oh, fuck. Fuck. Uh, and everybody, like, everybody starts, like, running. Uh, and I think that is the end of the Escher, this session tonight. Damn. The end of the Escher. The end of the Escher. The end of an era. The era where everybody didn't know who the Council of Eight was, except they totally did. <laughs> Nobody it was, was a, even disguising their voice, oh, really. Damn. It was a really poorly <laughs> kept secret. <laughs> Hey, it was a cool secret. Well, <laughs> sometimes voice mod permanently breaks, and you can't do the and you can't weird do the, you can't voice. You can't do the cool shit anymore. Uh, well, so that was our session. Thank you guys for joining me tonight. This was a uh, this was an extremely lore dense one, but it was an extremely but important one. It was, one. It was, it was like I, this to me. This session was like it was like pulling the ripcord on the like <laughs> to like supercharge to kick into like the the the. the climax of the of the campaign like it about to go off from yeah, here got stakes now so many people to, so many investments in, i might have to get get real serious about messing with tabletop sim because uh let's, let's fucking do it i think it's gonna be better to have it for some of this stuff because from here on out they're gonna be a lot of fighting <laughs> yeah Oz, Oz, start drawing cards <laughs> just start pulling <laughs> Just start uh, well, that, naked is our, uh, that is our session tonight. Thank you to our sponsors, Little Dragon Corporate Cardboard Castle. Thank you, Dogs for Life, coming in right at the end. I didn't know if Dogs for Life was with us, but I see the uh, I see the logo there at the end. Uh, and, and, you know, thank you to the audience. Yes, we're going to yes. send this message. Thank we appreciate thank you. It. Thank you to thank you to, to Quaker Oats. Just Quaker Oats. When you need a wholesome, filling breakfast and you don't have a lot of time, Quaker Oats. Please I do like oats. I eat oatmeal every day. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this episode, this episode right. brought to you by uh, <coughs> hoagies and oatmeal. Oatmeal. Uh, thank you for joining us. We will see you uh, next week, I believe. I don't think there's any reason we're not here next week. No, sir. Uh, we're next, not here week. next week. And then the week after. I believe uh, is Provo birthday, birth, 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 Provo birthday week. Ooh, uh, so we'll have a Provo is. birthday week uh, session of D and D. We basically have something every day of that week. Uh, there will be prizes, giveaways. Make sure to tune in for that stuff. Uh, we'll be here on Tuesday for Delve. Uh, we'll be here on Friday for a session that I have to remind her she agreed to do, where my wife is going to DM for uh, for some folks, uh, which is sure to be gonna be fun uh, a calamity of unmatched proportions um and that is uh that's all i got for everybody this week so we will uh we'll see you next time bye everybody bye